When I first came to Berlin in the early 90s, I introduced myself to my roommates as a Californian Dada jazz trumpeter. Then I took out my horn to show them. I would have never thought to describe myself as a Jewish American with Austrian heritage, even to a well-established Berlin music journalist like Wolf Kampmann. I remember pretty well when we first met in the early 90s. Um, you had just arrived in Germany. I had the impression you were probably a little bit unsure about yourself. And I found out that you had played in the Klezmer Conservatory Band and I asked you if you were Jewish and you said no. A little while later I was uh, sitting on a train to Bremen and in front of me was another guy uh, writing down some music and he introduced himself and it was uh, Alan Byrne who also have played with the Klezma Conservatory Band and I mentioned you. I said Paul played in the Klezma Conservatory Band even though he isn't a Jew and said Paul is Jewish and I said no. Paul told me that he's not Jewish and uh, we We almost started to argue about it. This past year, the Jewish Museum Berlin curated an exhibition titled A V Yiddish, featuring artists that reflect the Jewish identity in their work. It was nice to be invited. But I also asked myself how I had turned from being a Dada jazz trumpeter into somebody who thought of himself as a Jewish artist. What happened between then and now? Welcome to the English version of my WDR feature, Not Jewish Enough. Well, let's start from the beginning. When I was a child, I remember that my father's idea of being Jewish was like belonging to a club. And for some reason, anybody whose name ended with Stein, Berg, or Witz could be part of that club. When I got pimples at the age of 13, I was supposed to go to a dermatologist whose name ended in Stein, Berg, or Witz. Dr. Von Berg may not be the best dermatologist, but he's a Jew. My mother, in 1938, fled with her brother on the kinder transport from Vienna to England. I lived in Vienna, Austria, or should that be Wien, Österreich? As long as I can remember, she claimed that there couldn't be a God if something like the Holocaust could happen. So both of my parents identified strongly with being Jewish, but left God out of it. Although we lived near Temple Beth Shalom in San Leandro, California, my mother decided to participate in neighborhood events by signing up for a Bible class at the Methodist Church near our house. Sometimes I went along with her, and Reverend Hodges, who is a great storyteller, told us once that Jesus was Jewish. Around that time, it must have been the fifth or sixth grade, we were learning about world religions in school. When we got to Judaism, I said, hey, I'm Jewish. Tammy, who sat next to me, looked at me and said, you're Jewish, I don't like you. She didn't like me because I was Jewish? I asked her why, and she said, because you guys killed Jesus. I was really confused because I had just learned from Revan Hodges that Jesus was Jewish. And even worse, Tammy was the first girl that I ever had a crush on. We're in the 80s. After high school, I went to the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. One of the professors there, Hank Kisnetsky, had the Klezmer Conservatory Band. Their trumpet player, Frank London, was just making a big in New York, and I often got a sub with the band. That was a real inspiration at the time. One day, my mother called me from California to tell me that great Uncle Max had died. That's my grandfather's brother. Even though it was tragic news, my mother seemed strangely excited. Your grandfather wrote an autobiography. Uncle Max didn't like it, so he hid it in the basement. My grandfather was Hugo Wolf. No, not the composer. 
My grandfather's day job was being a lawyer, but he was also a passionate writer and enjoyed the Viennese coffeehouse scene. He was friends with Stefan Zweig, who later helped my grandfather and grandmother escape Nazi Vienna. Hugo had stories and poems published in a number of Viennese journals, including Karl Krauss's Die Fache. When Uncle Max died, we found a box of these documents in his basement, including an unfinished autobiography from my grandfather. So why did Uncle Mac hide Grandpa's autobiography, I asked my mom. Because it was too dirty. Uncle Max didn't like it. (laughs) My mother replied, we could get a clean copy. No, dirty like, embarrassing dirty. Your grandfather was a skirt chaser, a ladies man. Oh, I'd like to read that. You can't. But I'm old enough, I told my mom. No, dummy, you can't read it because it's in German. My motivation to learn a new language jumped from zero to a hundred. Durch Chokwa lernte ich Stefan Zweig kennen, der sich sofort für Through Chokwa, I met Stefan Zweig, who was interested in me right away when I sent him some pages with about 50 poems. Stefan Zweig wurde hauptsächlich von der Jugend und von den Mädchen verehrt. Stefan Zweig was particularly revered by the youth and girls. He was a reflection of Hugo von Hoffmann's Teil, who was a god in the misty distance. He was also a reflection of Arthur Schnitzler, who was also already a part of the old guard. After I graduated from the New England Conservatory of Music, I got a job touring Europe with a Broadway show. I met musicians in Germany who encouraged me to go to Berlin. So I started learning German with my grandfather's dirty autobiography. I'm still working on the German. When I read my grandfather's autobiography, the problem is not the affairs. It's a dramaturgical problem. Every time Hugo writes about something interesting, like meeting Stefan Zweig in Café Central or hearing the premiere of a Debussy symphony, the story takes a turn and he disappears with an actress or a waitress. In Dusia war ich sehr bald verschossen und begann meine Rolle als geistiger Verführer an ihr zu erproben. Naja, davon wird noch die Rede sein. Ich veröffentlichte ein Stefan Zweig had connections for my grandparents to leave Vienna. But it was also good that Hugo kept his day job as a lawyer because that's what saved their life, as my mom explained. The Nazis came walking into our house, about five of them, to take my father away. But my father was a lawyer And one of the Nazis recognized him. My father won a case for that man. And that one man was so thankful to my father that he told the other men, let's go, don't take him. My father was in the middle of looking for books to take with him to the concentration camp. He didn't realize how terrible it was going to be. Both my parents and grandparents identified themselves with being secular Jews, but my great-grandparents, who went from Hungary to Vienna, tried to change this family history, as my uncle explains. My grandmother, who was Orthodox Jewish, I got a rabbi to give me instructions while my parents were on vacation in Italy. And when my parents heard about it, uh, they came rushing back to Vienna and they threw out the rabbi. My parents were very, very um, atheistic. Was there a such thing as cultural Jews? Well, we were cultural Jews in the sense that I had Jewish school friends, but we had no connection to Jewish religion. Now let's go to Berlin, just after the fall of the wall. As for me and a lot of my colleagues from different places in the world, Berlin became a second home, a city that opened us up, both personally and artistically, a city where one reinvents oneself. Hello, my name's Christopher Blenkinsop. I play with a Berlin-based band called 17 Hippies. 
I describe Berlin as empty, actually. Um, empty in the sense of a vessel waiting to be filled with anything, with culture, with memories or whatever. I noticed this about you, Paul. Um, you had all this sense of, oh, I'm from California and I'll go to Europe and I'll follow my mother's footsteps and whatever. And then you get stuck in Berlin. And of course you get stuck in Berlin as an American and especially as an artist because because Berlin is so empty and Berlin's whole history is basically created by people like you who come here and fill it with stories and memories or whatever. <laughs> Christopher from the Seventeen Hippies is right. I had played klezmer music in the States. I liked it. But I never dared to start my own klezmer band because I didn't feel Jewish enough. That was it. I wasn't Jewish enough. If somebody had told me, Paul, you're going to make eight CDs of Jewish music and tour with it for years and years, I would have had a good laugh. But in Berlin, when I was recording my first jazz album at the radio station, I happened to meet Joshua Horowitz and Joel Rubin, who were recording a traditional klezmer CD in the studio next door. I later learned melodies from that exact CD and even took klezmer lessons from Joel Rubin here in Berlin. Kurt Björling, a well-known klezmer clarinetist, had collected recordings of traditional klezmer music and put them together in a box of seven cassettes for people to buy. Almost all the klezmer bands at the time had their repertoire from that collection. I'm Sander Meurdeke, I play the accordion, and I'm originally from the Netherlands. I'm Christian David, clarinetist. Uh, this cassette collection came from Kurt Björling of the band Brave Old World. Kurt is a musician himself, and he's searched flea markets, old archives, collected an insane number of records. Groups were, for example, the State Orchestra of the USSR, or musicians like Mishka Tsiganov, Naftule Brandwein. Still important historical names today. Back then it was a treasure trove. It's true that different people were playing the same pieces because they had learned them from that very collection. People from Germany, America, Japan, Scandinavia or South America. I think it's almost too comprehensive. Many bands have adopted those pieces into their repertoire. You think you're playing a tune that nobody knows and suddenly you meet someone from France who says, oh, I play that too. Let's play together. This is a historic recording from the legendary klezmer clarinetist Neftel Brandwein. Neftul immigrated from the Ukraine to the U.S. in 1908, and the melodies that he brought with him had influenced both traditional and modern Jewish music. And this is the same melody played by my band, Paul Brody's Sadawi. <laughs> In the late 90s, the Berlin Arts Council had given me a grant to join together contemporary klezmer musicians from New York and Berlin. The result of this was my band. We had toured quite a bit and made three CDs for John Zorn's Tzadik label. Being accepted into this label, well, to use the word I used upon my father at the beginning of this feature, I felt like I was in the club. The idea of the radical Jewish culture on John Zorn's label Tzadik was that Jewish music doesn't have its own genre. Instead, Jewish music is in every other genre. And it's not necessary to be Jewish and play Jewish music. But it is important that the music you make as a Jew is made with a conviction, I am a Jew. And so John Zorn said that if, for example, Lou Reed were to play a song as a Jew, then that is radical Jewish culture. He wanted this idea to apply to other art forms as well, ballet, film, literature. Another thing happened around this time. 
I became a father and wished for a regular income. So I applied for jobs in the local music schools. Nobody needed a trumpet teacher. Nobody needed a jazz teacher. So I offered to teach a klezmer course. This is a little embarrassing, but I must admit, I exaggerated my knowledge of the culture and of the music. Within a week, I found work, both in the community college and in the Hans Eisler Music Conservatory. This forced me to really learn the music, to do my homework, to learn the forms, the scales, the history. I thought that teaching klezmer music twice a week would become monotonous. But at the community music school, I taught mostly older folks who, for them, learning klezmer music was something to do with reckoning with the past, with their family history. They were really dedicated into getting each trill, each turn, each swoop in the klezmer music like it should be from back then. There was even the discussion before a concert if the band should use microphones because real klezmer musicians from back then had no microphones. In contrast, for the young musicians at the music conservatory, klezmer music meant New York, Lower East Side, John Zorn, avant-garde. And when I tried to teach them traditional klezmer nuances, I often got the remark, hey, let me play this melody how I feel it. I don't know what bothered me more, the exaggerated reverence from the older students or the lack of respect from the younger. Life's transformations often begin before one is conscious of them. While teaching, I couldn't stop thinking, this is the strange fate for the son of a Jewish refugee to come back to Europe, to Germany, and despite the um, foggy relationship with the culture, teach Jewish music? On the other hand, having the responsibility of teaching Jewish music inspired me to learn much more than if I was only performing it. And between the first and second thought, I spent a lot of hours exploring the melodies, like wandering the streets of a newly found city. The wonderful clarinetist you're hearing in my band is Christian David, who's well known for his knowledge and ability to interpret East European and Jewish music. Let's go over to Christian's house and talk about Jewish music and jazz. Christian, how many CDs do we have together? I don't know. Four, five, no idea. You know, while improvising with her band, it doesn't matter how klezmer-esque I try to play, I often end up going back into the blues. And I think it's because the blues and klezmer music really do have similar scales. As a person who comes strongly from klezmer, can you play a klezmer scale for us? Okay, now I'm going to play, I'm going to try to play with my jazz-infested brain the <laughs> same notes and see how it sounds. Okay. The same notes. Yeah. You know, Christian, after playing for so many years together, this space between Jewish music and jazz still fascinates me. How how similar the two tonalities are, yet worlds apart. Yeah, I mean, Jewish immigrants were doing that already in New York a hundred years ago. But I think it was maybe more of a one-way street. Jews were more interested in assimilation and finding a new audience than the other way around. But, I mean, there was a time with it called klezmer Jewish jazz. Yeah, and there's something really old, and at the same time with this constantly reinventing itself thing, something new about it. Well, it's a deeply rooted, very old music, and it kind of became a global language. Yeah, 
and how you play klezmer and the blues is obviously completely different, but maybe there's something in the history that they share. Sure, and what's the same for me, it's not just the notes, but there's a certain heaviness. I mean, if you look at the history of klezmer, Jewish culture, African-American culture, the history of the blues, it's kind of the same story everywhere, you know. You have the same heaviness in your history. If you go somewhere, the path isn't easy, and that's totally in there for me. Heaviness or heaviness? <laughs> um, here's the tension note for me in the blues. This, this note will always descend, always go down. I think it's the same thing in Klezmer. Just in Klezmer, it's more of an opener and you're hanging up there, you know, and it takes a while until you get back down. Now I'm back home. <laughs> nice. Similar notes, but a whole different kind of music. Sure, it comes from a different culture, a different history, even a different physical sense of being, I think. Let's take these first two main notes, this minor third that's so important in the klezmer and the blues. And now you with klezmer. You know, this, this light dancing that you do on the note, this ba, 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 that's very particular to klezmer. Yeah, that's a typical Jewish gesture for me. It's from prayer or similar things. It's, you know, you insist, you repeat the note, you try to explore it, try to find out what's behind it, and, some of it, it, and it always has to keep going. Yeah, and for me, this tension note is more like, oh, I'm tired, I want to get home and rest. Exactly. You know, I can start like that, <laughs> but then it pushes me. You know, I can start exactly the same way. But I can't stay there. I have to repeat. To finish our session, I'll try to play the same thing, but with the blues. Over time, the feeling of klezmer deepened in my musical imagination, the architecture of its tonal structure, this step-by-step -step climbing up the scale, like climbing up the ladder of a slide, then for a second balancing on top before gliding down, sometimes falling too low, then climbing back up to play a melody like this, to wander away from the root tone for the sole purpose of finding one's way home. That feels very Jewish to me. The music of traveling musicians and melodies passed from one generation to the next, often over borders, languages, and cultures, is not always documented as we would like. As researchers put together pieces of the puzzle, more questions arise. These blurry places in history leave room for the imagination. I love, for example, that one melody can have several different titles and even be attributed to different composers. Some of the melodies you're hearing during this feature are dedicated to those lost places in history, and a number of the compositions are composed with the idea that if Jewish music would have developed without the interruption of the Holocaust, what would it have sounded like?
in the States, even some of the most experimental musicians in Jewish music were playing traditional music at weddings and funerals and functions. They shared this collective experience, which they often used as a springboard for innovation. In Berlin, I lacked this experience. Although I was deeply interested in a folk tradition, it was cut off from its function. The term disembodied folk became important to me. This, through the idea of disembodied folk, I could rest in the idea of simply asking the question of belonging. I think there's a huge gap between tradition and reality. Our idea of tradition is usually a projection that has a lot to do with our longing. We long for a paradise. We long for a place of peace. And that's where we often root our idea of tradition. Berlin is a place where Jewish culture was cut short by the Nazis, a place in which this sense of longing seems to gather. That's why so many musicians come here from all over the world. They come and discover a tradition that may never have really existed. They invent a tradition that they imagine might have been. We're in the year 2002. My band was scheduled to play in a jazz club in Berlin. And we were trying out a new drummer. We were sitting backstage waiting to play when the club owner peeked in smiling. That was a good sign. This club owner only smiles when his club's full. We're sold out, he said. You can start now. The potential new drummer looked at the curtain, then looked at me and said, Wow, Paul, well, good idea. Find a kind of music that'll attract people, make a jazz program with it, and earn money. You need to know I'm not the compulsive, angry type. I've been a sissy since the first grade. But something about what the drummer said made me see red. I pushed him against the wall and yelled, Get out! Get out! Take your drums and leave! We're playing without you! Get out! Everybody was shocked. The drummer apologized, but I shoved him towards the door. I'll throw your drums on the street if you don't leave. This is my music from my people. It's not commercial crap to earn a buck. This comes from a meaningful place of which you know nothing about. Get out! That night, I played higher and wilder than ever before. And the drummer played a little too nervous to get the gig with the band. Months later, I was still in shock about that night. I knew I got the teaching jobs and some nice gigs because of the Jewish thing. But why did the drummer's comment trigger that in me? And what was this meaningful place that I was screaming about? Die Vertreibung aus dem Paradies beginnt mit einer Frage. <lacht> Wo bist du? <lacht> Fragt Gott den Menschen. The expulsion from paradise begins with a question. God asks Where are you? I think that's the reason why Judaism has survived for 2,000 years, because it reinvented itself always through questions. And the questions are built into the understanding of oneself, into self-identity. When the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and after the Bar Kochba uprising, almost no Jews were left in the in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, Judaism had to be reinvented completely, reimagined. Who are we? What are we doing? How will we continue to practice our religion without the temple? And what, what can we do now when the center is gone? What's, what's the inner core of uh, what's holding us together? I realized that almost my whole connection with Jewish culture was lived through playing music. In a way, it was my, my golden calf. At this point, I felt that I should either stop playing Jewish music completely or learn about being Jewish apart from music. So, also here, we fangen mal mit dem Lamet an, weil das brauchen wir nachher beim, beim Shalom. A week later, I found myself sitting across a kitchen table from the future Rabbi Offenberg, who at that time was a ah. Hebrew teacher. Und mit der Zusammen, zusammen ja. ist es Shah. Shah. Nochmal. 
Sha. Sha. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm Ulrike Offenberg. I'm a rabbi. Today, I'm the rabbi of the Jewish community in Hameln and I also work as a rabbi in Berlin. And when I met you, I was still a long way away from being a rabbi. That's when I gave you Hebrew lessons. I noticed how much I enjoy teaching Jewish stuff and Hebrew and uh, connecting them to life because what we too were doing wasn't just some standard religion class in the congregation at Sunday school. You were already an adult who had uh, discovered his Jewishness on his own way, especially here in Berlin. And that was fun, interesting, to wander on that trip with you. Yeah. As, as, uh, aber nennt man das Lame? Ja, Lame heißt der Buchstabe und der wird als H gesprochen. Shalem. Shalem. Und Shalem heißt ganz und davon ist natürlich, also hier ist Sha. Sha. Schall. Schall. Shalo. Shalo. Sha. Sha. Lom. Lom. Und? Shalom. <laughs> After all these years of things that had something to do with being Jewish, my father's choice of doctor, my mother's denial of God, my grandparents chasing a rabbi out of the house, surviving in Berlin by teaching Klezmer, almost beating up a drummer backstage. I read the word Shalom in Hebrew for the first time. Excuse me if this sounds sappy, but I had tears in my eyes. So the verse uh, of, of Hillel is... Of course this Hillel saying is well known. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? But I've never really seen what it was. If I am for myself alone, what am I? It's a chain of questions. And if not now, then? So Judaism was never a religion of answers which says this is how it is and this is how it must be. Questions are simply part of questioning. Speaking of questioning, although we played mostly jazz venues, people often came to hear something Jewish as our arrangements of traditional klezmer became more and more verfremdet, as they say in German. Audiences questioned more and more if the music was Jewish. Although for me it was clear I could understand with the electronic stuff and the jazz style solos that the audience wouldn't get it. That's not klezmer, you're pulling on a leg, a woman called from the foot of the stage after a concert. And one time, during a quiet passage, I heard a young man whisper to his girlfriend, This isn't klezmer, this is jazz. I don't really like jazz. I got a lot of inspiration from reading Martin Buber, and I loved his collection of Hasidic tales. I often thought that these folk stories were like the klezmer tunes. You could take them and tell them in your own way, transport them to your time and your place. So when we were on stage and the audience seemed to be drifting, It's amazing how the ears become more tolerant to strange music with a little story. Thanks. And now for a story. When I hold my hand up, you're going to help me with the name of the rabbi, Rabbi Rabinovitz. Let's give it a try. Rabbi Rabinovitz. Fantastic. <laughs> rabbi Rabinovitz was very old and sick. His students sat around his bed while he slept. They were hoping that he would teach them something before parting for good for the next world. So, after hours, he woke up. What? What is it? The students asked. Said, I dreamt that I died and made God face to face. What happened? What did he say? The students asked. Well, said, I had always thought that when I died and met our maker, he would ask me, why couldn't you have been more like Moses, such a good leader? Or 
why couldn't you have been more like Solomon? So, so wise. What did he say? The students asked. Und Rabbi Rabinowitz. Rabbi Rabinowitz continued. Or why couldn't you have been more like David or Samson, such strong men? What happened in your dream? The students asked. Rabbi Rabinowitz murmured. I dreamt that I died and met God face to face, and he asked me, Why couldn't you have been more like... Donkey Shen. That's why we pray the rest the way we do. we do a test after the concert, and I'll give it up at the bar. Peter Wurtzman here, man of words. Not a bad name for a writer. Living in New York is Peter Wurtzman, who also has German-Austrian Jewish roots. Our families are from the same neighborhood in Vienna. I grew up with one foot in Europe, one foot in America, and a third foot somewhere in the Atlantic. I think that's a real enriching, imaginative way of thinking of one's identity in different places. For you, this German-Jewish-Austrian mix, is there a center for you? Can you describe There's a that? wonderful line from a Friedrich Hollander song. Here's a rough English translation. If I could make one wish come true, let me have just a smile or two. Too much happiness is bad for you. Then I'd be homesick for being sad. Most Jews, somehow, that's the German-Jewish way of thinking. Beautiful. I'd be homesick for being sad. (laughs) Well, that's really living between worlds. And you live in New York, right in German, and you sing Friedrich Hollander. So in America, you grew up with German, and it became part of who you are, also as a writer. Most Jewish immigrants didn't speak German anymore. My parents decided that the language didn't belong to Hitler. It belonged to them, too. And that's why I speak German. But for me, Judaism isn't just a religion, it's a culture. And I have a feeling of belonging. I would like to read to you a sentence from my upcoming book, Stimme und Atem, Out of Breath, Out of Mind. For me, being Jewish means, above all, bearing a deeply engraved question mark in my brain, like a badge of honor, to be certain only in uncertainty, and as soon as I arrive anywhere, to already look around for the exit door. You know, Peter, Berlin has become a second home for me. And strangely enough, it's where I developed a strong sense of Jewish identity. I wanted to produce an album in German that reflects Jewish culture. The poems of Rosa Auslander show a similar world that you write about, and I love the way she often describes finding home and language itself. So we recorded this poem from Rosa Auslander. She wrote this poem as a dedication to a fellow Berlin poet, Elsa Laskeschuler, and it's about finding home in the breath and roots of speaking German. And you'll hear the wonderful singer Jelena Kulic. This document is addressed uh, to the financial office of Moabit West in Berlin and concerns the German citizenship. And there it says it is decided to relieve the Jew Hugo Israel Wolf, born September 4th, 1888 in Vienna, last national residence, Vienna, 
current residence Budapest of his German citizenship and the expansion of this ruling to include his wife and children. I had a gig at the Wiener Festwochen, the Vienna Theater Festival, improvising some crazy trumpet stuff to a piece based on the story of Echo and Narcissus. Before going to Vienna, I contacted historian Robert Streibel, who dedicates much of his work to the area in Vienna where my mother lived, the 13th district, Hietzing. He found documents about my grandparents' house, about how after Germany took Austria, my family was forced into German citizenship, then kicked out of German citizenship because they were Jewish, and about where my mother went to school before she was put on the kinder transport. So what do we do with all this? The family history, searching and questioning. Music as an arm to an imaginary tradition born in the reinvention city of Berlin. If stories and ideas don't lead to action, then what good are they? Well, doing this feature inspired me to get my German citizenship so I could vote. That's one thing. Talking with young people is another thing. Robert Streibel helped organize a meeting with students at my mother's old school. Given the current political trends, it seemed particularly important to share this history. If not now, then when? Still in a daze from the previous night's premiere party, I found myself walking down Wenzgasse to the school. I passed my grandparents' house, Wenzgasse 24. It was a two-story mansion. I'd like to add that Robert Streibel found a document saying that Joseph Goebbels' Viennese filmmaker, Karl Hertel, bought my grandparents' house for a very good price. My mother's old school was at the end of the block. As I approached, the weight of the past became unbearable. I understood why I told that German music journalist over 20 years ago that I wasn't Jewish. I was running away from what I never knew. Now I'm running to it. I was more nervous than a hundred theater premieres. I stood in front of the school listening to the sound of children playing, clutching the folder with pictures of my mother when she was young and family documents stamped with red swastikas. The teacher brought me to the classroom. The June heat invited the atmosphere of summer vacation and eating ice cream. How can I tell this story without alienating the kids? My mother had recently passed away and showing her pictures here was overwhelming. How can I connect with these kids? Well, I took up my horn. I blew some Californian Dada jazz, probably about the same licks that I played for my Berlin roommates over 20 years ago. But this time, I was playing them as a person from a Jewish family. And before discussing the dark history, we talked about my grandmother, one of the only dentists in Vienna in the 1930s and how my mother would take the tram that's still on the street corner here downtown to practice with the children's department of the Vienna Ballet. And we performed one of the poems that my grandfather had written while living on this very street. I asked, who's the class showman? And everybody pointed to the back of the room and said, Ben! Who is the Rampensau? Rampensau Band, wir machen eine Performance. Unvergesslich. Von deinem bleibenden Anlitz, wen noch immer. Die großen Gedanken. Greift noch immer dein Traum entschleiertes. Kann ich nicht lesen, dorthin. Wo der Tag am reichsten ist. Noch immer rollt wie ein starres, rundes über mich dein Wort, das sicher ge geschärfte und drinnt das Fieber meines Mundes in deiner Hände Herbstes Kälte. Back in Berlin, I unpack and throw the pictures and documents I showed the school kids in Vienna on the floor next to the music for Echo and Narcissus. 
During the show, I snuck in a few klezmer licks just for fun. I still love to play klezmer, but I don't need to play it to feel Jewish. Any sound coming from the horn, regardless of style, is Jewish. The yearning, the searching, and questioning in sound form. Music can embody the question without demanding an answer. This is my uncomfortable forever home, meine unheimliche Heimat. And questioning is such a strong part of that, that sometimes I feel like the symbol for Judaism shouldn't be the Star of David, but a question mark. Would all this have happened without my grandfather's autobiography inspiring me to move to Berlin to learn German? My Jewishness is similar to my parents and grandparents, but there's a fundamental shift. My parents and grandparents' generation associated being Jewish with flight and assimilation. For me, it's about returning and becoming. Is becoming a German Jew completing the circle? Before we conclude, I'd like to mention that there's one thing I still don't understand. Why do Jews answer questions with questions? Well, how should they answer? Thanks for listening. This was Not Jewish Enough. The original title for the German station WDR is Jazzy Diaspora, Birth of a Secular Jew. We've heard from Wolf Kampmann, Christian David, Zara Murica, Rabbi Offenberg, Robert Streibel, Christian Blenkinsopp, and Peter Wurzman. With research help from Carol Scherer, Robert Streibel, Micah Birk, and Annika Stadler. The musicians of the Sadawi band are Christian David, clarinet, Martin Lillick bass, Michelle Greener drums, Kristen Kuger guitar, Paul Brody trumpet, and Jelena Kulic vocals. The editor for the German version for WDR is Leslie Rosine.